Well, it has been an interesting news cycle. A Virginia Democrat, one of my colleagues, got caught saying the quiet part out loud and immediately tried to backpedal on her bill, which it is alleged could potentially lead to the prosecution and felony charges against parents for not satisfactorily affirming their child's gender. We're going to actually analyze whether that's true. We're going to look at the reporting. We're going to look at the comments. We're going to look at the actual bill. And we're also going to equip you to be able to distinguish between some of the things that are said and what can actually happen within a law. Because lo and behold, the Washington Post wasn't being entirely honest with us. And I know that comes as a shock. All of that and more coming up on this episode. Welcome to this episode of Making the Argument. As always, we would love to hear from you in our volley chat, which you can join and discuss this topic with us at the link in the description of this show. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to meet you, and we'd love to get your thoughts on this topic. All right, you know everybody, so I'm going to jump right into this. I remember a particular day within the Virginia General Assembly where Delegate Guzman, who happens to be the uh, patron of the bill that we're going to be discussing today, had a different bill, and it was fairly complex. Um... And it went through the committee process, and by the time it got to the House floor, it required six friendly floor amendments. So let me explain what that means very quickly. Typically, you get all the amendments for a bill. Now, you know, not, not every bill that's submitted is perfect. That's why we have a subcommittee process and a committee process, and it goes through this process, and we find different problems. We add amendments. Not a problem. But this one got through the subcommittee, through the full committee. And by the time it went to the House floor, it required six friendly amendments. Now, sometimes people will submit a floor amendment to kind of mess with your bill, right? Because they, they want to talk about something, they want to bring up an issue, so they submit a floor amendment. Sometimes they do it because they honestly think it would make it better, but it's not considered friendly. A friendly floor amendment is when somebody submits the amendment and you as the patron approve of the, of the amendment. I've been in the General Assembly seven years now. I don't think I have ever seen a bill other than that one that required six friendly floor amendments before you could get it to the point where your own caucus would support it. Like I, I just haven't seen that doesn't, that doesn't typically happen. So when we got up to ask questions about these multiple floor amendments, because the other thing about floor amendments is unlike the bill itself, the rest of the members of the general assembly, we don't know what these new floor amendments are until they're submitted. And sometimes you don't get a lot of time to read them before all of a sudden you're expected to vote on them. So typically the speaker gives more time for there to be floor debate and questions on the floor when you're adding so much at the last minute to a bill right before you're all supposed to vote on it. But not Speaker Philicorn. No, no, no. She didn't do that. In fact, she shut off debate rather quickly. And I remember Delegate Guzman getting up there and saying, well, you know what? This bill had a rigorous hearing within the committee. If that's true, why did you need six friendly floor amendments to get it to a point where you, your own side would vote for it? All this to say, Delegate Guzman isn't necessarily the best at defending her legislation on the floor. Right? So what I find interesting as we go through this and what you're going to see is that there's the, there's the, the Washington Post version of what the bill's supposed to do um, or the specific wording in the bill. And then there's Delegate Guzman's statements when she's not being careful about what her actual intentions are. And we're going to analyze what, what happens when there's a problem with that. So let's, let's go to kind of what started all of this off. And this is Delegate Guzman, and she did a report. Uh, she, she's in an interview right now, and um, she talks a little bit about what her bill would do or what the intention is. So let's go ahead and play that for you real quick. Democratic Virginia delegate Elizabeth Guzman is a social worker, and she's planning on reintroducing a bill in Richmond that she says would help protect LGBTQ children from their parents and guardians who may not be affirming of their child's sexual orientation and gender identity. This is how we're going to push back. Her bill would expand the state's definition of child abuse and neglect to include parents who do not affirm their child's gender identity or sexual orientation. There's an investigation also in place that is not only, you know, from a social worker, but there's also a police investigation before we make the decision that there is going to be a CPS charge. What could the penalties be if, you know, the investigation concludes and it's concluded that a parent is not affirming of their LGBTQ child, what could the consequences be? Well, we first have to have an investigation. You know, it could be a felony, it could be a misdemeanor, but we know that hey, pause real a CPS quick. charge. Pause it, real quick. I, I want to make something very clear here. She talks about it could be a felony, it could be a misdemeanor. Um, 
if, if you get a felony in Virginia, you lose your voting rights, right? Like you use your right to have a gun. You lose your right to run for office, right? That's a significant charge. We're, we're not talking about a, a ticket here. So we're, we're now, we're now dis- discussing in the realm of if you don't quote, affirm your child's gender, you could potentially be facing felony charges. Now, she says, it's, you know, obviously there's going to be an investigation. There's going to be a CPS investigation. There's going to be a law enforcement investigation. You know, but again, this is, this is what she's advocating for. Go ahead and play the rest of it. It could harm, you know, your employment. could harm your education. And Alexandria, Nick Minox, 7 News. And Delegate Guzman tells 7 News that she is hoping to pass the bill in the upcoming legislative session. Okay, so... Delegate Guzman, this is this is a bill she carried in 2020. She's trying to bring it back for the 2023 session. That's the one we're about to go into. Starts um, in January of 2023. At least that's what she's saying <laughs> until some of her own colleagues in the Democratic Party, um, they, they did something really interesting. So uh, Delegate Don Scott, who's the uh, leader of the um, Democratic Party, uh, the Democratic House Caucus, said, yeah, yeah, we're, we're not going to do this bill. Because Don realizes that there's an election going on. Don realizes that there will be another election going on next year for the Virginia House of Delegates. Don also realizes that they've been getting taken to the woodshed by parents recently because of how Democrats have treated parents and because of what Democrats have been doing within their school system. And so Don's smart enough to understand that, gosh, maybe submitting a bill that could lead to the felony conviction of a parent for not affirming their child's gender to Delegate Guzman's satisfaction, maybe that's not something we should have on a campaign brochure. Right? Like Don understood that. And Elizabeth Guzman immediately backpedaled. So go ahead and pull up the article. Like I think within 24 hours, 24, 48 hours, can I just say, I cannot believe that she went on tape and said it could harm your employment. Well, I think, okay, so to be perfectly fair, because I want to be intellectually honest here, there's two ways to interpret that. She could have been saying it'll harm your employment. Like she could have been saying we're going after that. Or she could have been saying we'll do an investigation, you know, before we do this because we know it could potentially harm your employment. So let's, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt on that just to be perfectly fair, right? I'm giving, I'm giving as much you know, leverage as I can That's here. Even well, though you're I, giving her the benefit the of the doubt. The idea that there would not be an investigation was never even a thing. Whoever said, oh, <laughs> they're not gonna, even going to investigate. Of course they're going to investigate, but yeah. what they find is going to be based on what you make definitions of in the law well, now. But, but here's what's great. So, for, <laughs> so within like 48 hours, this hit. Like this went all over Twitter. We were sharing it. You had national level. Ted Cruz was sharing it. This was going all over the media because, again, this is another instance of a Democrat saying the quiet part out loud and getting caught, right? Saying it on tape. Um, so very soon after, you know, Don Scott comes out and says, Yeah, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna push this on the Democrat side. Virginia delegate says she will not push bill that penalizes parents. Uh, who LGBTQ plus children who do not affirm their gender identity. And then she went on to say within the article that, well, that there's a Republican controlled house and they would, they would never let it come to the floor for a vote anyways. Next <laughs> speaker, Todd Gilbert. So speaker of the house, Republican Todd Gilbert immediately <laughs> shared that article and did the quote Guzman's office told WUSA nine that the bill does not have the support to pass it. And that the Republican house speaker will never put it up for a vote. Todd Gilbert puts this down and goes, I pledge to Guzman that I will send her bill to the floor for a vote. File it. <laughs> so by the way, we, we just need to clarify for those that are wondering. <clears throat> yeah. This is not the Republican Speaker <laughs> yeah. of the House endorsing the no. bill saying he's going to vote for it. What this is is a excellent example of political brinkmanship, so to speak. Yeah. He because wants to force them on the record. Yeah. What he's trying to do is say, you know what? We have the committee. So so in, in, in the Virginia legislature and also in Congress, too, we have the committee structure in order to kill – most legislation, most legislation doesn't get to the floor, no. right? Most legislation dies in committee or it gets rolled into something or whatever else, well, right? But the reason that we have that structure is because not every bill should be debated on the floor, right? Yeah. But in this case, what what Speaker Gilbert is trying to do is that he wants to put every single Democrat in the House of Delegates on the record, on the record. Where do you of whether or not they support this because this is a wedge issue where, you know what, the overwhelming majority of 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 people in the Commonwealth of Virginia would oppose this bill. 
Yeah. But I don't know if a majority of Democrats would oppose oh, this. Oh, no. no I don't think not. they would. There's I, a reason now why they, they keep pushing say, it. They want to say that they did because, well, in 2020, we controlled it. We didn't, we didn't let it forward. It's like, look, every time I hear a Democrat say, nobody wants to, whatever they say next, give them enough power, give them enough seats, that's and that's exactly, exactly what, what they they'll do. do. That's exactly what they'll do. They've done it with guns. They've yeah. done it with education. They've done it with health care. They've done it with crime. I mean, it, everything. Nobody wants to... Put them in power and watch. What I mean by by this being a wedge issue, though, is I'm 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 trying to separate the Democratic base from yeah. the le- the elected officials. The elected officials. I mean, you pointed out Don Scott knows this is this is terrible oh, politics. Yeah. It's not just bad policy; it's also bad politics. But the Democratic base, I'd be willing to bet close to a majority, if not an outright majority, of Democrat voters actually would support this. But I know that the overwhelming, probably like sixty plus, seventy plus percent of people and the Commonwealth oppose this. And so this is an excellent example yeah. of how if this bill actually makes it to the floor and they vote on this, first off, it's going to get defeated overwhelmingly. Oh, yeah. Every Republican will vote against it. Probably close to half of Democrats, if not more, will vote against it. Everyone in, a, everyone in a difficult seat. Everybody in a difficult seat will. Yeah. But the, what, what, what this does is, is that it, it shows that the Democratic Party's elected officials in the legislature – are way to the left, yeah. way to the left of the average voter in Virginia. Yeah. Well, and, and again, there were some people that saw uh, Speaker Gilbert's tweet on this, like, how dare, how could you possibly? And I, I think the best reply I saw was another conservative got on there and said, can you tell me where you played poker? I'd love to show up. Because obviously they didn't get what the speaker was trying to <laughs> yeah. do here. The speaker was, tra- look, Guzman got caught doing something that is not only horrible policy, she got, she got caught doing something that is horrible for Democrats in an election year, right? And then when she decided to backpedal, because all of a sudden she wasn't so brave, right? Before it was like, oh gosh, I'm a brave crusader fighting for, okay, then why don't you file the bill? Oh, because the Republican speaker won't let it be heard. Speaker Tug up is like, I'll let it be heard. In fact, I'll promise you it goes to the floor for yeah. a vote. Ladies and gentlemen, at least 60% of the bills that get submitted never go to the floor because they don't make it out of the subcommittee or, or full committee process or the, the committee process in general. And again, that's that's not like a bad, evil thing. It's just an idea that, you know, we, we have to manage a lot of bills in a relatively short period of time. That's why if they go through a subcommittee and they go through a full committee, then you've got a pretty good chance that this is something they can pass on the floor. So this is about efficiency. It's also about making sure that we can make any necessary corrections before a bill goes to, to everybody. And it allows each delegate, 100 delegates, to not have to be a subject matter expert necessarily on, on everything through 17 committees, right? We get to focus our effort on the three or four committees that we participate on. And, and again, this is a, the process makes sense. Yeah. But when the speaker promises you, your bill will go to the floor. Everyone wants their bill to go to the floor. Everyone. When your speaker promises you that and you decide, well, I'm, I'm not going to file it anyways. That tells you something. Bam. So no, yeah. the speaker did absolutely the right thing on there because again, she was trying to blame us for the reason why she wasn't going to file the bill. You know why I know that this was so damaging because of the way that the mainstream media covered this story yep. tells you everything you t- you need to know. And Nick, you found the Washington Post article on this, which is just, it, it, it's incredible the way that they portray this. Well, it's, you know, some, there, there are some media outlets that um, do this thing called reporting. And then there's other media outlets that see their job primarily as running interference for their preferred legislators. And Delegate Guzman clearly falls within one of the you know preferred legislators for the Washington Post. Um, you know, democracy dies in darkness. Yeah, um, their mission statement. Their mission statement. <laughs> so here's here's what the Washington Post said. And this is great because we're gonna we're gonna discuss a little on the problems with the way that the Washington Post is characterizing this. Or characterizing this. The measure proposed by Delegate uh, Elizabeth Guzman, Prince William County, would expand the definition of child boost to include inflicting physical or mental injury on children due to their gender identity or sexual orientation. Democrats scrapped the bill in 2020 on grounds that it was redundant. Child abuse was already illegal in state code for any reason. The bill got a very different description Thursday in a TV report, which said Guzman wanted parents to face criminal charges if they do not affirm their child's sexual orientation and gender identity. That description, which Guzman called inaccurate, led Republicans and Democrats alike to object. Some Republicans took to the TV report's use of affirm to mean parents who deny gender-affirming medical treatment to their children would be guilty of child abuse, something that is not in the bill. Okay, so this is this is a case of the Washington Post going out of their way to give 
the interpretation of what the bill says and what Guzman's intentions are the best possible coverage. If you're wondering, hey, Nick, do, does the Washington Post ever do that for your bill? No, the answer Definitely would be no. Not. It never does that for any of any Republicans' bills <laughs> ever, period, the end. In fact, in one of our bills, the Washington Post is more likely to find something that isn't possible and then suggest that not only will that be the thing that happens, but that's the full intention of the bill. Yeah. Right? So th that's how the Washington Post plays this game. So I want to look at two things because Guzman went, one of the reasons I found this is because Guzman went on Twitter like, oh my gosh, I was so misrepresented and this is not what I meant and this is not what the bill does and oh my gosh, how could they treat me this way? What's crazy is that she was in, in a video interview saying these things herself, Nobody she wasn't portrayed, to she was not portrayed no. any which way. No, she look, portrayed I, herself this I know, way. Look, videos can be selectively edited. All right. Let's, again, let's be intellectually honest. Videos can be selectively edited. Okay. Um, this Washington Post article goes on to say that in the full report, she said that, no, no, we, we wouldn't prosecute parents for, for not um, affirming their child's uh, gender identity, even though earlier in the article, that's certainly what she seemed to be success earlier in the interview. That certainly seems to be what she was suggesting. Now I want to go back to her Twitter page because again, what, what she was saying, and if you look at the Virginia code and we're going to look at that later, she's saying that, no, 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 this is, this is all about just protecting trans children from abuse. Which I, I think most people look at like, yes, we all want to protect children from abuse. But she said, and, and again, we'll get into the bill, mental injury, right? So if you inflict mental injury, intend to inflict mental or injury, allow, allow, it, allow it to happen, you're now guilty of child abuse against your kid if it's in reference to their gender identity right. or sexual orientation. That allowing it to happen is an interesting sticking point yeah. because that means if you don't take action mm -hmm. and they stay in this dysphoric state, it then requires it positive requires action. It requires yeah. positive yeah. action, which is, what's another word for that? Affirmation. Yeah. So... Elizabeth Guzman goes to Twitter, right? Because she's just so heartbroken and frustrated by, by all this. Why did I do this interview? Why didn't I hide from a story that could have been and was twisted to misrepresent what was an anti-abuse bill? Why didn't I play it safe and stay silent when presented an opportunity to talk about LGBTQ plus issues? Because Governor Yunkin is a bully and I will always stand up to bullies. Okay, so real quick, just out of curiosity. Sure. Bullying, one could, one could say that bullying leads to the physical and or mental abuse or injury of someone. Correct? Sure. I think I think I don't think that's a stress mm -hmm. or a stretch. So why is Governor Yunkin a bully? Is Governor Yunkin a bully because he came out and he berated trans children? Is he a bully because he came out and he said trans children are not allowed to go to school anymore? Did he did he say, oh wait, no, what, what did he say? Oh, I remember. He came out with a policy that said, hey, Public school system, if you're going to start calling Jack Jacqueline, right, if you're going to start affirming or, or what you call affirming a child's gender, before you start doing that, you should notify the parents, right? It, it wasn't, hey, hey, teachers, you got to go around and report on all the sexual orientation issues of your student. It was none of that. It was before you as a teacher or a member of the school take positive action to reinforce a child's belief which might run contrary to their actual biology, you got to notify parents of that. That's bullying. So what does this tell me? It tells me that Delegate Guzman, who, oh, by the way, was a social worker and did these sort of CPS investigations, it tells me in her mind, something as simple as that is akin to bullying, which is akin to inflicting physical or mental injury. So spare me at the Washington Post and spare me, Delegate Guzman. Now, let <laughs> notice how she got ratioed. Oh, yeah, and big time. She, she got 92 likes, but 387 replies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm willing to bet they weren't all positive. Can I just point out the Washington Post's angle that they took from this article? Notice how they constructed a straw. Here's what they did. They constructed a straw man, and yeah. then they tore down the straw man, and they said, see, this isn't really a big issue. They do this all the freaking time. Yeah. They, the Washington Post goes out there, and then they they present an argument that nobody's making, and then they tear down that argument, and then they say, see, the real story is Republicans pounce. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's it's not that Guzman carried a bill to criminalize parents who refuse to indulge in a fantasy that the public school system might be trying to push on their children. No, 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 no. The real story is Republicans are upset about the bill, yeah. not what's actually in the bill. This is something that the media does all the time. All the time, no matter what the issue is, the story is always the Republican reaction to the bill yeah. rather than what the bill itself is or the Republican reaction to the policy rather well, than what the policy is. Ben, ben Shapiro has identified this pattern as Democrats will do a thing, Republicans will notice the thing, and then everyone will get mad at the Republicans for noticing for the noticing thing. For noticing the thing, right? yes. Like, and, and we're tired of it. Or like when they say the quiet part out loud yeah. and we recognize, oh, you just said that out loud. Yeah. It's like, no, I didn't. You're misrepresenting yeah. what I said. We're going to run a whole story about how Republicans are pointing this thing out yeah. and how, you know, they're being mean by doing well, this. Well, even, then here's an idea. How about you stop filing the bills to say yeah. these yeah. things or to do these even things? Even in her Twitter post, it says, I will not let my record be distorted by anyone. And I will always stand up to Republican attacks yeah. against our children. No, instead, she'll let her record be distorted by herself. Yeah. Um, well, I, and Republican I, attacks against our children. I got I got news for for Delegate Guzman. Keep your hands off my children. Keep your hands off of other people's children. What is so difficult about that? I, I get it. You have a particular worldview. If, if your child comes and identifies in a particular way, I'm sure you will go to great lengths to affirm and reinforce that impression, regardless of whether or not it corresponds to reality. And while I might have a problem with that, I still respect that you're the parent and they're the child. And provided that you're not going into the realm of actually physically abusing them, right, you have the right to raise your children in a way that I might disagree with ideologically. But that's not good enough for Delegate Guzman. No, no, no. She has to turn the state and the law against the rest of us. And for anybody who thinks this is hyperbolic, I invite you to look at the National School Board Association memo that they wrote to the Biden administration calling for the Department of Justice to be sicked on parents who were showing up at school board meetings and even went so far as to potentially suggest that the National Guard should be used. So, no, I'm, I'm sorry. We're not the crazy ones. Yeah, we are we're, living we're, we're in a the, really strange— We're not the insane ones here. You're doing stuff, and that's the amazing part. They can do the stuff. They can put it out on Twitter. They can brag about the stuff. And when we point it out and it looks bad, they're like, we're just trying to defend children from Republican attacks. We're not the ones trying to carve up and drug confused adolescents. Let's talk about why those kids are confused to begin with. Because 20 years ago— the numbers were much lower than they are now. Why exactly would that be? And there is this, this body dysmorphia or there's dysphoria, sorry, uh, gender dysphoria, where it's like they're generally uneasy with their gender, right? Why would that be now more so than ever before? Could it possibly be because there is something being pushed right now on our kids to question their gender all the time? Like they are so hyper focused on gender. No wonder so many kids are so confused because you're telling them the sky's not blue and don't believe your eyes. Basically, you could be a boy even though you have a vagina. You know, I'm sorry, but the thing is, is right now we're not trying. <sighs> OK, I have this big issue with letting them frame up the argument completely. I have a problem when they label something that is clearly not true. Um, and they did this with uh, solar farming. Uh, when everyone knows a solar farm is not a farm, everyone knows it, but they use the word solar farming so that it sounds less invasive, less like industrial. Being produced. Yes. And uh, like, like they're nurturing something to grow. In reality, it's industrial solar fields. They want to blanket the earth with industrial metal, you know, fields. It's not farming. Okay, so gender affirming, they're saying you need to affirm their gender. That's not what they mean. They mean you need to affirm their dysphoria about their gender. So if they feel generally uneasy about their gender, we need to push them deeper into that and push them through to the point where now they're taking drugs, we're cutting up kids now, and you're telling me that's not abuse? I wanna know how many people at the end of the day, when this all comes around, how many people in 20 years from now are going to have major health issues because of what these people pushed, and that's not gonna be called child abuse later on? 
I, I think it will be. And I think that they are going to have to account for what they've done. Well, it's going to be interesting because we're going to look at an aspect of that when we actually read the bill. But there's one other thing I want to go to because I, I think Guzman destroys her own argument when she suggests that, oh, no, no, it's 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 not what I told you over here. It, it's what the Washington Post is saying, right? It's not what I said to this news channel. It's what the Washington Post is saying about my bill, right? It's what I'm saying about it now that I've had time to gauge the reaction, and now I need to cover my tracks. But here's another person that was working with Delegate Guzman on the bill. So let's go ahead and listen to what this person had to say. This podcast. I've been working with a senator or no, a representative, see, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> in a small district that I'm not a resident of, and she's a former social worker and has her clinical degree and recognizes the abuse and the long-term harm caused by not affirming your kids. And so we were working on a child protection bill that would make it illegal to not affirm. Mm. After national backlash to Guzman's bill, the podcast is no longer available. Pause. And Pause real quick. I want to hear the rest of this. But so the person that is so Guzman, when she's asked questions about it, she reinforces that this is an idea where, again, she's asked a specific question about affirmation. And she says, oh, yeah, there'll be an investigation. It could lead to misdemeanor charges, could lead to felony charges. The person that is working on the bill with her says, oh, yeah, we're making it illegal to not affirm your child's gender. And then they pulled the podcast when it got out to the public. Right. It, that's the other thing that blows my mind but about again, all this. But sto again, the story is going to be about how oh, Ian yeah. Pryor, Republican yeah. operative in, in Northern Virginia, he's responding to this. That's going to – how much you know yeah. about the next he Washington pounced. Post article is going to be Ian Pryor pounces? Or the next story is going to be Nick Freitas pounces on making yeah. the argument. The story is always about our reaction to it, not about the fact that – that look, for those who don't believe this – the left is telegraphing yeah. through multiple mediums of uh, um, um, forms of communication. They're telegraphing us what they want to do at the same time that they're saying nobody wants to do this. This is a reoccurring problem over and over and over again. It doesn't matter what the issue is. This is just the latest, most outrageous example of this. Well, and I, I remember, I remember when almost every single Democrat that was running in the lecture where the Democrats took the House of Delegates, took the Senate, took the I mean, they, they swept everything in Virginia. And I remember the year that they were running, it was always, nobody wants to take your guns. Nobody wants to take your guns. We just want common sense gun control. The moment they took power, they submitted a bill that was going to criminalize like uh, tens of thousands of gun owners in Virginia overnight. And yeah, and not well it was it was going to take effect like January 1. You had like a a you had like a 5 month grace period to turn in stuff. Now, keep in mind, you weren't going to be criminalized for owning like just an AR15. I mean, you were definitely going to be criminalized for that. Yeah. No, no, you were going to be criminalized for owning a magazine that carried more than 12 rounds. All right? And every single democrat I think except for two voted for it. Right. So all the people that have been saying, oh, we respect the Second Amendment. We don't want to take your guns. It's just the moment they had the power, the votes they and the ability exactly, to do it. And they yeah. thought they could get away with it. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the third component. They need the power. They need the votes. And then they needed they to they need be to able think they to get, get away, away with, with it. it. Yeah. Right. They tried to do it because that's what they really wanted to do. They, they the Delegate they... Guzman, Delegate Guzman wants to do this. She loves the idea of parents getting in trouble if they don't affirm their child's gender. There was a there was a, a person that had worked an intern, intern for Scott Surville, who's a senator in Virginia, um, worked for him. He's part of the group in Fairfax County, which, oh, by the way, has teacher, as a teacher as a part of it, they set up a whole guide where kids that identify as LGBTQ could get away from their parents to an LGBTQ-friendly family, and they were providing funds to be able to escape and the whole deal. Now... A reasonable person can look at a situation where a child might be trying to, like, flee abuse, and we would understand doing that. But what they do is they change the definition of abuse to if you don't celebrate, affirm, or reinforce, in this case, the dysphoria, now you're engaging in abuse, and so therefore it's perfectly okay for us to engage in something that looks a whole hell of a lot like human trafficking. Because it is. So... Let's just be honest. Let, let's go ahead and look at the rest of this because this was interesting. This actually led to a federal issue, too, that, you know, again, this is going to be one of the most contested congressional races. So we're going to watch the rest of this. Now, there's no longer a scheduled debate in Virginia's 7th Congressional District. Uh, where are you, Abigail? 
parents deserve to know where you stand on this issue. In Triangle, Virginia, Nick Minock, 7 News. So when this all broke, when this all broke, Abigail Spanberger, who was in a neck-and-neck race with Yesley Vega, essentially canceled her debate with Yesley Vega, refused to debate. Because they don't, she doesn't want to bring this up. Well, she's, let, let, let's clarify that Spamberger has been campaigning with Guzman, but it's not just that, too. Isn't there, um, wasn't there also a person that was working on Spamberger's campaign that came out and was caught on, um, uh, on, on, on there, there was like a recording um, where somebody working on Spamberger's campaign said something like, parents that don't affirm you know, the gender dysphoria of their children deserve to be, quote unquote, looked into. I, I don't know. I, um, so I don't know that personally. What I will say is this. When I was running against Spanberger, um, we asked for three debates hoping we'd get two or, or maybe it was five hoping we get three. I can't remember. We wanted to debate. And, and by the way, I'm an incumbent. And in my district, when a Democrat runs against me, I always agree to their debates. I, I like historically, I've always agreed to do every single major debate that's that's offered. It's I usually, mean, sometimes they could do like a setup type of thing. You, I agree to do ag- it in a setup. Well, I know you even agree to that. But like, I understand when a candidate refuses to do one where it's like, oh, well, this Democrat run thing is going to have Democrat. Yeah. yeah. You know, skewed questions. No, and, they do, and Abigail did that. She did that with us. Some of the private debates she wanted to have were, were hosted by organizations or one was hosted by an organization that clearly favored Abigail. And they you didn't tell by want the it questions. recorded. Like yeah, they there didn't were certain want ones they didn't want recorded. I found, I found the, the headline on the on the Daily Caller of, of the story. that. OK, I go ahead. Up. Yeah. Mention that. I, I just sent it to Hamilton if he wants to bring it up. Um, it's, it's from the daily caller. It's, um, we don't need to read the story, but it's just the headline is, is the thing that's important. The audience can go look at the story in more detail. Um, but there it is. This is just a few days ago. This is, this is part of the reason Spamberger yeah. canceled the debate yeah. because she's caught in the crossfire on yeah. this now. And she doesn't want the race. The last thing that Abigail Spamberger wants is for the race in the 7th District to be decided about whether or not parents should go to jail yeah. for denying uh, for not properly affirming, affirming their dysphoria. child. Yeah, for That's not pro- the last thing that she wants the yeah. congr- every you know, time congressional she, campaign every to time be Every time she's exposed around. on something like this, too, she has, like, this verbal, like, foul language meltdown. Which she just well no like against our governor just recently and like before that yeah. she's she was mad that she almost lost her election to Nick over uh, defunding the defunding police. the yeah. police and yeah. so like every time she's found out to not be the moderate she says she is yeah uh, she has this you know oh I will, horrible I will say this. language one of the things that Abigail Spanberger does incredibly well is when she's in district man she keeps it together she is on narrative oh, yeah. she is on point she talks about what she wants to talk about small she does town it. folk I, oh, I yeah. care about small town Virginia I just Virginia want to be folk. one of the good guys right like all this all this stuff she would the only public it wasn't even a debate it was a forum the only public forum she would agree to was in like mid October so like almost half the electorate voted early Right. So she refused to have a debate. And this was in a year when Democrats were trained. It was a really tough year for Republicans um, running in 20 because you had COVID going on. The media was going after Trump. You know, Democrats were, were favored to win seats. Like, I mean, it was not an easy year for us in this year. She so she went from, hey, it's a favorable year for Democrats. I'll give my opponent one debate. You know, a few weeks before election day. It wasn't even a full debate. It wasn't forum. even a full debate. It was a forum. Now we have a situation where things are trending in favor of Republicans. She doesn't right? even want to have a debate at all. She doesn't want to debate Yesley Vega, period, right? Because I think Yesley would just, I think Yesley would do a fantastic job on the debate stage. But yeah, she there's want a to reason Yesley. why they've got to lie about Yesley she, Vega all across yes. all their ads. She doesn't want a Terry McAuliffe moment. No, she does not want a Terry McAuliffe moment because she knows this is the issue the Democrats lost on. The irony being that if if McAuliffe had not attended the debate, he would have been slammed for it. But you know what? He probably would have won that election. And that's what she's betting on. She's betting that she's going to run the clock out. If she has to show up and debate, she loses this election. If she refuses to debate. That's right. Brave CIA agent. I want to be one of the good guys. I was law enforcement with the Postal Service. Like, um, ooh, yeah, that's me. I'm just one of the good guys, and I'm moderate, and, and I'm where everybody's at, but refuses to debate her, but refuses to give her constituents an opportunity to see a debate between her and her opponent, who, by the way, who, by the way, is a woman of color. I mean, Abigail Spamberger right now could just say, you know what? I'm just going to surrender my white privilege and make sure that this district is represented <laughs> by a woman of color. But no, she won't even get on the debate stage with her. 
And it's because they don't want to have to answer very specific questions about this because Guzman said the quiet part out loud. And as much as the Washington Post wants to run interference for, as much as certain members of the press want to run interference for, we heard it. We've seen what they've done. As much as they want to take down podcasts, you know, uh, uh, affirming what we all knew about what she really wanted yeah, to sorry, do. Sorry, guys. Internet's forever. Yeah. So, you know what? Sorry. Tough. And the fact that she is backing away from a debate because of this is absolute garbage. I mean, I told somebody, what they're like, well, you know, under what circumstances, Nick, would you not want to do a debate? I'm like, quite frankly, I'd be happy to debate my Democrat opponent in a dark alley surrounded by Antifa. Right. All I ask is that you oh, televise come on, it. Nick. We all know that's what you prefer. All I ask is that you televise it, so, right? Because they can't. How do you defend this? Right. There's no forum where you can effectively defend this. No, and, and, there's and not. Tim Anderson, Delegate Tim Anderson, did a great job. He would. He got invited up to a forum in Georgetown. Where I mean, we're talking like the author of Lawn Boy was there. One of these books, the the books that. They've yeah. been trying to get out of the middle schools and stuff like that. He was in a panel like him against like five people that were all anti him. And and he made these simple, he, this was brilliant. He made the simple statement. He was like, I don't think teachers should be talking to eight-year-olds about masturbation. And every other person on the panel said, of course they should be talking to eight-year-olds about masturbation. He knew, he knew he could get, he knew he could get them to admit and say the quiet parts out loud. And you know Spanberger, Spanberger is smart enough to know that if she shows up to this debate, the probability of her getting caught. That she'll say something that will end up tanking her, similar yes. to McAuliffe did a, yep. a, about a year ago, will be very high. But if she just skates on, you know, flies under the radar and yep. yeah, she'll be slammed for not attending the debate. But guess what? If she debates, the odds of her winning re-election goes down. Yeah. So therefore, I'll just take the heat of not attending oh, but, the debate. But here's the thing. She won't be slammed by anybody that's considered mainstream oh, yeah, press. Yeah, no, Washington because, Post won't run Because what she'll that. do is she'll do this thing where she tried to set up a, a hit job on Yesley Vega. Mm -hmm. And Yesley said, no, we, we've got, let's go to this debate. This is public. This is neutral ground. That's the way the debates are supposed to be. And so Yesley was like, no, we need to have the, like these rules that don't favor one side or the other. And then Abigail tried to make it to where it's like, oh, well, you know, you don't want to debate. But then when it comes to an actual forum, an actual debate yeah. where it is supposed to be on neutral ground, and it won't be, it'll still favor Abigail, but it won't be as blatant, you know, then Abigail backs out of that one because, again, she doesn't want to have to answer hard questions. So the question that I've got is, and this is something that the audience is probably wondering, so... The Washington Post ran a story. Guzman put out, you know, this long Twitter rant that she ended up getting ratioed on. Yeah. There's all these people that are saying, that's not what the bill says. That's not on the bill. That's not what I wanted. So, so what does the bill actually say? Great question. So if anybody wants to know, so uh, first of all, let's say this. Every state is different with respect to how they track bills and things like that. Virginia, I think, actually has one of the better websites for tracking legislation in Virginia. So this one is, has become so you know, popular right now or so infamous right now that you can pretty much Google, you know, ha you know, House Bill 580 2020. And this is you're going to get a link to this site, which is called LIS. This is legislative uh, legislation information services. Uh, I will say on the search site, the one area that's really bad. In fact, I should probably carry a bill for this. Their, their keyword search is horrible. Oh, yeah. That's when you're looking for legislation. Everything it's else absolutely is pretty horrible. great, though. Everything else is good, but that search engine is, is garbage. So we're sitting here looking at House Bill uh, 580. This was submitted in 2020. This is the one that she said she was going to submit in 2023. We'll see if she still has the courage. This is the identical text. This what is, she this told is the, the reporters. So if you look at it, the way the legislation does, it'll show you the code section. So it says be enacted. But well, let's go from the top. So you have the bill number. You have the date it was offered, the date it was pre-filed. On this one, it'll tell you who the patrons were, and it'll tell you what committee it's been referred to. This one got referred to health, welfare, and institutions. All right. So if you're going down. It says the, the being acted by the General Assembly of Virginia shows you the code section. And then one thing I want to point out, because people get this confused sometimes, they will look at a bill and they will automatically think that anything is written, anything that is written in that bill is what is being proposed by the patron. That is not the case. All right. So when you look in Virginia, the, the regular text, that is language that is already in code. What's being changed, what's being proposed by the delegate is anything that's italicized or lined out. Lined out is being taken out yeah. of existing code. Italicization is being added, added. to existing code. Yes. All right. So what she did is, I'm going to read this whole thing. Bear with me. It's it's one paragraph, but it says, uh, as used in this title, unless the context refers, requires a different meaning, abused or neglected child means 
any child less than 18 years of age, and then it goes into section one, whose parents or other person responsible for his care creates or inflicts, threatens to create or inflict, or allows to be created or inflicted upon such child a physical or mental injury by other than accidental means, or creates a substantial risk of death, disfigurement, or impairment of bodily or mental functions, including but not limited to a child who is with his parents or other person responsible for his care during the manufacture or attempted manufacture of a Schedule One or two controlled substance during the unlawful sale of such substance by that child's parents or a person responsible for his care where such manufacture or attempted manufacture or unlawful sale would cons- constitute a felony violation and then it goes in a different code section and then this is what she adds everything that you just read off is is already existing in law. existing, code. existing yeah. law and this is what she adds or whose parent or other person responsible for his care creates or inflicts threatens to create or inflict or allows to be created or inflicted upon such child a physical or mental injury on the basis basis of the child's gender identity or sexual orientation. So what you had here in the beginning was the, kind of the standard for child abuse. If you're if you're beating your child, if you allow someone else to beat your child or you're causing severe if you're causing mental trauma, that's illegal, you can't do that. What I find so interesting about this is that but not limited to or, or excuse me, it says um whose parents or other person responsible for the care um yeah, inflicts, threatens to create or inflict or allows to be created or inflicted upon such child a physical or mental injury by other than accidental means or creates a substantial risk of death, wait for it, disfigurement or impairment of bodily or mental functions. Yeah, already in the code. And there's people doing chopping up kids, putting them on on puberty blockers and like, what is it, castr chemical castration medication and that doesn't fit the to me that fits the original uh abuse sounds like maybe guzman's version of the bill this year will be striking that out (laughs) okay so listen i think a reasonable person could come to that conclusion now the thing that you look at with abuse part of what they're trying to identify is intent okay but and, and what they've now come to say is like, oh, well, if the child wants to transition, well, then the intention is not to abuse. The intention is to help. But here's what I find interesting. When you put this particular code section in and you say allows to be created or inflicted upon such child a physical or mental injury on the basis of the child's gender identity or sexual orientation, that is written broadly enough to where if you had a social worker that was that had the same ideology of, oh, let me guess, Elizabeth Guzman, who was a social worker. They got plenty of room to to suggest that you've now inflicted mental injury on your child if you're not affirming their gender identity or sexual orientation. That's the first part. But here's the second part that should be considered. If in any other scenario, disfigurement or impairment of bodily or mental functions falls within the definition of abuse, what happens when you have a different portion of the code section that essentially allows for a carve out? And what's that carve out for disfigurement or impairment of bodily and mental functions if it is in the support of affirming a child's gender identity or sexual orientation? So if I'm a judge, the thing I'm wondering as I look at this and as I look at the stated intention of the legislator, as I look at the debate, as I look at everything else, the thing I'm wondering is, is did they just create a carve out to make it okay to, to make it okay kids. to disfigure or impair bodily or mental functions if it's within this particular section. Actually, it's even worse than that because it doesn't just make it okay. It requires it because mm-hmm. it says or allows to be created or inflicted upon. Allows. So that means inaction, like not not doing anything about it, is allowing this to continue, yeah. which means you're forced now to disfigure yeah. your child. And the crazy part is like she would get up there and say, well, that, that's not what the bill said. And the Washington Post, the, the bill doesn't specifically say that. Okay, to, to all of our friends at the Washington Post who don't know how to read legislation yet, let me help you out with something. Because you seem to get this in other pieces of legislation. You look at what a bill allows, what it legally permits. Bills don't sit there and say, oh, and this also applies to Judy and to Steve and to Bob and to Rick. No, if it allows it, it allows it. If it restricts it, it restricts it. This is not only allowing it, but it's creating this strange legal area because we all understand that if you have disfigurement or impairment of bodily or mental functions, like for instance, if a child needs surgery, right, because they have cancer, we understand that's not disfigurement. We understand that's not impairment of bodily or mental functions, right, in an illegal or abusive way. 
But they're adding this whole category now to where if my child says, I think I'm a girl and I want to ship them off to get puberty blockers or chemical castration medication or start doing surgery, well, then that doesn't fall into the realm of abuse either. Plus, if I'm not doing it, as you pointed out, if I'm not doing it, am I now refusing to affirm? Am I now engaging in a situation where I'm allowing for physical or mental injury to take place. And now you can have your kids taken away. Meanwhile, you have people actually committing horrible, abusive atrocities on kids. And the Child Protective Services is all about, like, let's try to get them back with their parents. That's always going to be number one. Let's let's try to get them back with their parents. It, it's just, it, it's amazing to me because if you look at the way this is written, and, and there's a reason why even some, Demo again, being intellectually honest, there's a reason why even some Democrats were like, yeah, this is written really poorly. That, that's getting back to what you were bringing up at the beginning of this show. Yeah, that, her needing that, all those amendments. Th that Guzman, quite frankly, does not know how to file legislation. Or oh, she knows how to file in it. favor of her <laughs> legislation. Well, no, 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 no. I yeah. mean file legislation that would even be acceptable to her own caucus from a language standpoint. Because as you pointed out, there actually are pro – I, I think, honestly, the Democratic caucus, if, if they – were the only people that, that could decide whether or not this gets passed. I think it'd be very close. Oh, I honest. do too. But, I and I too. think the only reason that half of the people that would oppose this is because of electoral concerns. Yeah. yeah. But I do think that a lot of those Democrats that would be opposed to this, a, a good chunk of it would be because th this is so poorly worded yeah. that it would lead to electoral consequences. Yeah. E even among members of the public that don't have kids or that aren't directly impacted by this, because as you pointed out, you've, you've created a carve out for allowing for disfinger, uh, d d disfigurement or, or impairment of bodily functions. As long as it's in pursuit of, of allowing that, that gender dysphoria to be affirmed. Yeah. And by true. the way, I keep saying gender dysphoria on purpose because yeah. Tina brought up something earlier when she was using solar farms as an example. And I really think that this is something that it, th this is something that I think the audience can walk away with and, and actually take some value from the left has monopolized defining the debate for too long. Yep. And until we stop using the phraseology and language that the left uses when it comes to um, when it comes to defining the debate, we're just going to continue losing. Yeah. yeah. And and there's so many examples of this. Solar farms is just one of them, but this is another one. The phrase "affirm" sounds positive. Yeah. Gender identity sounds at least neutral. Yeah. Well, they just and say so gender you, half the time. When, Affirm when, their gender. When when you say yeah, that's true as well. When you when you surrender the English language to the left, who are a bunch of postmodernists that don't even believe in objective <laughs> language because everything's all relative. Yeah. You're basically surrendering. You've already entered the debate losing. Mm -hmm. You're already yeah. you're already halfway to losing at that point. Yeah. No, I, I think I think Tina brought up a really good point, which she said, don't don't concede this whole idea of it's not gender affirming, it's dysphoria affirming. It's dysphoria affirming. And here's here's the interesting thing. There was a a, a study out of Sweden um, extending over 30 years and, um, and it was strongly supported, uh, uh supportive of transgender. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> it d documents their lifelong mental unrest and it says 10 to 15 years after surgical reassignment, the suicide rate of those who had undergone sex reassignment surgery rose to 20 times their comparable peers, 20 times higher. So you're telling me that putting a kid through all of this is worth them having a 20 time higher suicide rate. I mean, if I were to frame this up the way the left does, I would say you are on the side of suicide and you want kids to die. Mm -hmm. You want people to kill themselves. That's how because the left treats us all that's, the time. That's when they just cut right through and they go, here's what you want. Honestly, I'm looking at this going, how, how could they not see the damage they are doing long term in doing this? And what benefit is it to them to do this to kids? Because they I mean, kids can't even what when is it that they are fully developed in the frontal cortex? It's usually between like 22 and 25 years old. And, yeah. and w so women develop a little bit faster than men. 
It's, which it's, which it's comes as a shock to nobody. Here, here's my question. After Yunkin won, it would be very easy for the rest of the country to see that Virginia could be this like Republican beacon or red beacon uh, for what's to come. And then a bill like this gets reintroduced or gets brought back up. Should our listeners across the country... F- you know, be concerned that bills like this could be introduced in their state as well. Oh yeah, abs- absolutely. Because uh, it, it, this is where I go back to some of the other arguments that we've made about what's going on with an education, what's going on with, um, you, you know, some of the, what they call uh, queer theory, uh, critical race theory, all these things kind of, again, stem from Frankfurt school. Um, and, and a lot of it's influenced by Marx. Some of it's influenced by people like Foucault and Derrida and, um, the Sartre, existentialists Sartre, and the yeah. oh, by the way, and all three of those people that I just mentioned, Derrida, Foucault, and uh, Sartre, who are, again, talk to anybody that's gotten, had to take any sort of classes in, in philosophy or whatnot. Uh, these people were very, very prominent. Yeah. All of them signed on to a letter in, I think, May of 1968, which essentially was calling for the decriminalization of sex with children in France. Right. So, and, and a funny, I pointed this out and somebody said, oh, you're going to define all of us by a couple of, you know, French lefties. Like, these people weren't just random. This wasn't some random dude in a cafe in Paris saying this. These guys have been majorly influential in academia. It was academia. 1974. Yeah, 74, okay. Honestly, these are your thought leaders. And so, yes, we're going yeah. to define you by your thought leaders. Well, yeah, again, when you and, – and, and this – I don't want to get I don't want to get too far afield here, but it, it's the whole idea. Re ask your question. Oh, actually, it was seventy seven. It was seventy four that the French legislature started debating this. Yeah. Let me ask this: Has California or any oh, other? Oh, yeah, yeah. Left- should, should you be concerned? Yes, because ultimately, what this comes down to is this is this is a, an outworking of worldview. Like, if you're looking at this, is this just just some sort of one off crazy thing that they're suggesting? No, it isn't. This is tied into a larger worldview, and in that worldview, they believe that your sexual identity is such a core component of who you are. And your sexual identity can essentially be anything, right? So the moment you come up and say, wait a second, no, there's there's objective biological standards with respect to whether or not you're a man or you're a woman. Th- this is not like, again, some sideshow. Right. This is core to their fundamental belief on this whole idea of self-actualization and how you can become truly you and, you know, fighting back against all these conforming patriarchal, you know, you know, Things that have developed over centuries, sure. right? So, it, no, it, it is essential for them, and they can't escape it. They did this on abortion too, right? Safe, legal, and rare was never going to be a, a sufficient argument for them on abortion because it acknowledged if you if you said safe, legal, and rare, you were acknowledging that something tragic was going on. Sure. And so they had to switch the debate that no, no, this isn't tragic. This is a manifestation of female empowerment. Well, this is a manifest manifestation to them, right? Of 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 capturing your truest self and your sexual identity. So anything that would potentially stand in the way of being able to achieve that, whether it be parents, whether it be societal norms, those things have to be opposed because if they don't oppose it, it it affects a whole host of other beliefs that they also maintain in tandem with this one. So yes, you're going to see stuff like this and you're going to see people, especially in bluer states, advocating for penalties for taking children away because in their minds, they honestly believe this is child abuse by not uh, by not affirming your child's dysphoria. I would be very interested to see what type of education soon-to-be social workers are going through on college campuses. I don't have any data on that, but I, I, I imagine that the there's been a transition in teaching over the past five years. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, over the past five years, probably for these social workers to be in line with this type of thinking. But I also find it concerning that if this bill were to pass, yeah. it'd be putting a lot of power into the social workers' hands. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and you need, you need to, <laughs> I, I really think this is important. And, and I'm not the first to say this. Um, William F. Buckley said it as well. He said, you know, we think they're wrong, they think we're evil. And, and I'm sorry, but this is true. You can see the way they discuss it on the floor. Now, I, I, will, I will admit that not every single one of my Democratic colleagues engages in this sort of environment but or this sort of uh, wordplay, but many of them do. And it's the whole idea of you're a bad person. And, and once you've convinced yourself that you're a good person and they're a bad person, it's not that they might be wrong on this particular, they're a bad person, then if you're the good guys, then even when you're wrong, it was for the right reasons. And even when your enemies are right, it's for the wrong reasons. So no matter what happens, they can always be disregarded. They can always be opposed. 
And, and that's what you see manifesting itself in the sort of legislation like this where someone honestly believes and doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to register with them that policies like this could potentially backfire on them. You are creating an apparatus where now the CPS agent gets to decide whether or not you're properly affirming your child. Okay, well, where did the CPS agent or what did the person with the, with the psychology degree or the psychiatry degree yeah. or the children's development degree, where did they go to get it? Who was handling that credentialing? What were they teaching? Because we we for the this longest is like CRT for the longest time parents have looked at this and been like well this is some stupid stuff that goes on at UC Berkeley and you know people grow out of it when they get into the real world ladies and gentlemen when UC Berkeley is defining these terms when they're setting up the credentials that the people are going to use to get the jobs in the real world and then all of a sudden you know the WEF and BlackRock and eventually your government is coming in with their ESG scores determining whether or not you are you know properly supporting you know, the environment and social standards and governance in the way that they want, or you will lose your job, lose your company, be unemployed, potentially be arrested, have your kids taken away from you. I got news for you. What's going on in academia doesn't stay in academia. Right. Oh, I, I, I've got proof of this. And I think I brought this up once um, before, maybe. Um, I was doing research for um, my last paper that I was writing for my master's program that I'm in. And it was uh, it was an interesting paper. It was about historiography. So it wasn't about a topic. It was about the history of that topic. How have historians talked about this topic throughout time? Because the way that historians talk about something today could be way different than how yeah. they talked about it 150 years ago. And um, the topic was about imperialism and colonialism. And so I was reading this paper from the 90s, from 1994, the year I was born. And I was just doing some research, trying to find some sources on how have historians, you know, 25, 30 years ago, how have they talked about this topic versus today versus, say, in 1880, when, you know, colonies were actually existing all over the world. And one thing that blew my mind, I wish that I could actually, like, find this paper again, was the phrases, the language, the approach to this topic that this paper was bringing up in 1994 was identical to the way that the postmodern left discusses colonialism and imperialism today, mm -hmm. that it's all of it's it's all an evil white construct. It's all built around privilege and gender and all of these these buzzwords and phrases. And I was reading this, and I was like, "This sounds like something that was written by some Berkeley grad student in you know last year." And then I looked at the date, and I was like. Oh my gosh, it took 25 years mm -hmm. for the language that academia was using yeah. to filter its way into the public mainstream. Wow. And that really illuminated so much to, to me in terms yeah, of like how- Yeah, that's because the people that they taught and the people that got those degrees are now in positions yes, of power. That, that, yeah. that really, like that paper really drove home to me that what academia- talked about 25 years ago or 30 years ago in between that is what will end up becoming debated in the mainstream a generation later, which means that if you want to know what's coming down the road in 20 or 30 years, just go look at what academics are talking about today. And that will tell you exactly what we'll be debating right. in the next generation. Tina, what um, concerns or thoughts do you have on this topic that may be unique to you as a mother? Um, well, they're, I don't really, because honestly, <laughs> we homeschool and we don't have anybody pushing this stuff on our kids. However, um, I do have family members who have some issues with the gender dysphoria and the level of confusion there is, is just incredible. And, um, my concern is that we are about to have a whole generation of people who are having fertility issues, um, who are taking their own lives and who have a very difficult time ascertaining what, what is real and what is not real because they've been pushed so far into a, a delusion about their body, which is one of the most fundamental things about us is, is our body and what right. we can see with our eyes and what we can feel and touch. And they've been told not to believe what they can see, feel and touch now. And so it just turns everything on its ear. And I, and I feel like we are coming into a period of time where, uh, 
we're just going to have a, a huge section of, of the population who, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I, it, it is. I think they're going to, I think they're going to feel betrayed. I think they're going to look back. Um, I think a lot of people right now in their teenage years are going to look back in their mid twenties and they're going to ask us, how could you have let this happen? Yeah. To they're us? going 30s. to feel hopeless and they're going to wonder why, to why more people weren't standing up when this was going on. And, and you're going to see, you're going to see when the data is there. You're going to like see adults. If you want to look at the data, it's there. You're going to yeah. see adults in their 50 be like, oh, but we, we were, we were letting you be your truest self. And they're going to look at them like, I was a child. Yeah. You were the person that was supposed to protect me from this. Yeah. Not reinforce every confused notion I had about myself yeah. or reality. Letting you be yeah. your true self doesn't mean that a parent should close an eye while their kid plays in the street. Yeah. Well, the job it, of being a parent is to is to drag the child off of the street and 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 show them that no, that will hurt you. Yeah. You, and and and, and it, it sounds but nobody nobody would ever say that a parent dragging their kid off the street um is, is an act of child abuse. Yeah. It's an act that even if the child is, is upset at that moment that the child, that the parent is doing that, everybody knows. And the child, when they grow up will know, Oh yeah, I'm really glad that my parent dragged me off of the street before I got hit by a car and killed. Well, and, and uh, I also uh, want to know where this ends because it's not just gender. Oh, no. We're seeing that with species, species yeah. it's race. Right. It's, it's everything else. Well, I, mean, I, I, I watched, there was, there was one gal um, who went through the transition process and has detransitioned. And she said one of the biggest things that she saw the medical community do to her parents was they would tell her parents, well, do you want a dead daughter or a live son? Wow. And she goes, you know, I never had suicidal ideation until after I transitioned, but my parents were essentially led to believe that if they didn't let me do this, I would potentially kill myself. Now, that doctor made a lot of money. That's what I was going to bring up. Look at how much money per surgery or, I mean, this is a big money. That's the scandal industry. that's going on in Vanderbilt right now where yeah. I, it was people like Matt Walsh and a few others that pointed yeah. out the surgeries that they're doing there. And they caught some of these people on tape yeah. at the University of Vanderbilt being like, there's a lot of money, literally saying yeah. there's a lot of money to be made. Because they will never be healed from what they're doing to them, either physically or psychologically. They will constantly need medication psychiatry they wow. will constantly need all of it because of what they're doing to these They'll kids be battling infection their yeah. entire the question life. that i've got and honestly this might be a topic for a whole nother podcast one day but the question that i've got is why is this happening why is it that for example in montgomery county the number of of um trans identifying students has gone up something like 900 percent in two years mm -hmm. this is like, like the left has their narrative of why this is happening that, oh, they've always been like this and yeah. this has always been the case. And now that, you know, we're just bringing it to light. But I, I think that most reasonable people that aren't on the left realize that that there's something that's pushing this. And let's it not can't call be it grooming. The kid. You better not call it grooming. It Christian. Can't, it, it can't it, it can't be the, the eight year old. So like. I don't know. I, I just think that that's that's a question that I don't think is asked quite enough is yeah. why is this why is this happening? They're I being groomed. I mean, it's grooming. It is grooming. And this is child abuse. Wait, we're not supposed to say that because it's offensive. I don't care. I don't like care. at some point you're you're hurting a child and and you're grooming them for something. The idea that they maybe want it's not sexual exploitation, but you are grooming them for something that I do believe is nefarious and harmful to them. Yeah. All right, if you walk away from nothing else, I want you to remember something that Tina said, and I want to share something I heard from somebody else I think it was really relevant. Stop calling it gender affirming. It's not. It's dysphoria affirming. And in no other situation where we think that sort of behavior would be appropriate, especially to impose on a child. If your child thought they could fly, you wouldn't walk them up the top of a 12-story building and say, go for it, Timmy. I support you. You wouldn't do that because it would be ridiculous and absurd. You wouldn't tell somebody suffering from anorexia that yes, your view of your body is absolutely correct and you should continue to do the things that are hurting you because we don't want to help your perspective on reality correspond with actual reality. No, instead, we want to let you go further and further and further into the confusion, into the dysphoria. And there is nothing compassionate about that. There's nothing tolerant about that in any sort of reasonable sense. So stop using the language that they're foisting upon us and call them out for what they are doing because I guarantee you we will have a generation of kids who not very long from now as young adults will look back and wonder how we let this happen to them.
And I want him to know that there was at least some people that were standing up that in the midst of their confusion, when they thought they knew what they wanted, were willing to actually be the adults in the room and say that if this is a decision you want to make when you're an adult, you have a right to do that as much as I may disagree with it. But as a child, you legally can't consent to being chopped up and drugged up in order to fit somebody else's political ideology. So be willing to stand against it. Once again, thank you for joining us. Please join us on our volley chat as well. There's uh, instructions in the link on, on how to do that. Become uh, involved in the conversation. Help us select topics for future events. Let us know what it is you would like us to help you make the argument for. We'll see you next episode.